livestream this. Um, so at the very end, if you have questions, I've asked Rich to go ahead and just repeat the questions so our uh, cyberspace people can hear what the questions are. So I'd like to introduce Rich. Thanks. Well, welcome. Just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been working with trauma now for 17 years uh, with combat veterans, active duty military, with uh, rape survivors and kids who have been traumatized due to domestic violence and abuse. And I'm an LCSW with an MPA and I'm currently a professor at the University of Utah and most of my teaching research is on the subject of post-traumatic stress. But I'm also have post-traumatic stress, had it since I was 18. So it's a personal issue for me too. I uh, was buried in an avalanche and then drowned on the Pequari and fractured my shoulder on the Murtaugh and almost drowned again. Was shot at up on the Payettes during a three day um, methamphetamine fueled crime spree that I somehow was at the wrong place, the right place at the wrong time and was mugged in Cuernavaca at gunpoint. And all those had an impact on me, but where my PTSD really got out of control was after six years of doing exposure therapy with combat veterans, day in and day out hearing the horrors of war. So PTSD is not only what I do professionally, but it's every part of my life every single day. We're going to bring in a few of those pieces as well. So the presentation today is about what is PTSD, the basics. Why do people get it? Like why do some people get it, some people don't? And then we're going to look at what works, like what is really effective in helping a person learn and grow from PTSD instead of being controlled by it. So let's just get started. This is kind of your basic straight up out of the DSM, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is what we use to really officially diagnose someone with PTSD. But there's a word up here I kind of want you to focus in on. First responders. If we're talking all of your brightest clinicians, researchers, medical doctors on the planet get together and they decide to put first responders in our diagnostic manual as a group that is at high risk for having post-traumatic stress. Because you're exposed on a regular basis. You witness on a regular basis repeated and extreme events. So if you're a first responder and you're exposed to high stress environments where there's crisis and trauma, you're gonna get post-traumatic stress. It's just part of the job. Um, now, a few of you may not, but, but most people will develop signs and symptoms of PTSD if they don't have some specific tools in which to shield their mind. So let's look at PTSD a little bit more. This is what a trauma is. Okay, it's, it's when things get upset, when you're equilibrium, when things get so out of control that you don't quite know how to handle it. So I'll give you an example of what is easy to handle. So this morning I'm putting this PowerPoint presentation together, kind of organizing my thoughts, thinking about what I'm going to say, and I'm watching my little boy Luke. He's almost one. And I go to the bathroom, and I hear a doot, 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 doot. And I come racing back out. I left my computer open on the couch, and somehow he had figured out how to delete every side I put together. <laughs> now that's a crisis, right? But it's one in which my brain knows how to problem solve quite quickly. I gave him a big hug and I was kind of giggling. I text my wife, she thought it was adorable. And then I took an extra hour to kind of recollect my thoughts and put this back together again. Trauma's different. It's something we don't quite know how to handle, mentally, physically. It's something that just overwhelms the senses. It's just something that's so out of control that it's hard to make sense of it in application to regular life events. You wake up and you shower, at least I hope you all do. You know, you go about your day, your shopping, your work. You, you, your life happens, right? But a trauma is that next level you just don't make, can't make sense of. It. Here's basic characteristics of events that we consider to be traumatizing. Severe illness. Uh, I did research for three years with cancer survivors. And every cancer survivor I worked with had signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress. 
Because they're facing death in the face, right? They're, they're looking right at it. It's an event that's painful. It's outside the norm. It's, it's physically just exhausting. A violent and unexpected death. Um, it's kind of a tough story for me right now, but three weeks ago at a tailgate game, I was hanging out with my buddy Rich. He's uh, 67. He just retired. Uh, I'm good friends with his son, Andy, and Jamie. And that night, he had a brain aneurysm and died. Like, just as he's retired, right? The family was just shocked. Like, instantaneous, their whole world got just rocked. It's these type of shocking events that can create signs and symptoms of PTSD. Threatened death and or injury. Car wreck. Um, <laughs> this is another interesting story, if you don't mind me sharing. Has anyone been up Big Cotton Canyon a lot? I love Big Cotton Canyon. It's my favorite place to backcountry ski. Anyone know where Middle D North Fork is? Kind of across from the spruces? Great skiing. There's this place called Powder Park. It was a random Wednesday. I had it off from work. I'm skiing Powder Park all by myself, touring the backcountry. Had this amazing day. Come back. I call Amber. I'm like, I'm on my way home. I'm all safe. I'm all good. I'm driving down. You know where Storm Mountain is? At Storm Mountain, I was driving down, and a Chevy 2500, it's gold, I still remember, lost control and slammed into my car, knocking me across the embankment into the gate. And it slammed so hard that it actually pushed the gate open. And it, I got hit so hard that the ski went through my seat. It just sliced my jacket. It didn't get me so good. Um, but stuff like that happens, right? Significant injury on a regular basis. And that's what you respond to. It's those type of events that really shock you, kind of upset your equilibrium. You just don't quite know how to make sense of it. So what really then activates PTSD? Like, how do we really know what's going to be, what's really going to cause it to get out of control? The type and size of disaster. Now, if it's an earthquake, you definitely can develop post-traumatic stress, right? But what if it's human cost? Like that train accident that just happened in New Jersey. It's when it's human error that tends to up the ante a little bit. It tends to be more fearful. Uh, people tend to have a perception that all of us should create safety for each other, right? Mother nature happens. We get that. But when humans make mistakes or they purposely engage in activities that cause harm, it really starts to have an impact on how we see and perceive the world. The source, you know, was it aggression or an accident? Um, again, you know, when I got in a car wreck, that one didn't really phase me. Accidents happen, right? It was a mistake. When I was shot at, whoa, what's going on here? That's not how people treat each other. You don't just randomly open fire on someone who's sitting by their campfire on the Payette River because you feel like it. Um, so when it becomes human focus, human aggression, um, when it becomes purposeful, that can have a significant impact on how the trauma is going to be perceived. One thing we also look at is how much trauma are you exposed to? It's like a one-time event. You can definitely develop post-traumatic stress. But first responders, how many traumas do you respond to in a year, in a career? When I was working at the VA, it was six times a day, five days a week, that I was exposed to the horrors of humanity through exposure therapy with combat vets. If you, on a regular basis, are exposed to trauma situations, to crisis, to high-stress environments, that puts you at significant risk for post-traumatic stress. So how do you know? Well, here's how you know if you have post-traumatic stress. These are the signs and symptoms. So intrusive thoughts. What is an intrusive thought? Well, it just pops into your mind out of nowhere. Um, you can't, it, it's, it's kind of out of control. It just, it just hits you. Um, is it okay if I kind of do an experiential exercise with you so you kind of get a feel of what intrusive thoughts are like? If you all take a minute and think of a favorite memory, 
and you probably got hundreds, but a, a favorite memory, a time and a place. I just got off the Grand Canyon. I did a, a river trip down there, a private trip. I took my boat, and I got to take my friend from high school. We've been friends for well over, I want, 25 years, I think. And we went through our first rapid badger, big, huge rolling waves. And she looks back at me with these big, huge eyes and says, that was awesome. That's kind of one of my favorite memories right now. So I'm going to have you take a moment, just think of a favorite memory. And notice how it feels in your body. Like I can actually feel being back on the river, that excitement, that little, the butterflies I get before I enter a big rapid. Almost feel my hands on the oars. And I can see her so clearly, right? I can even hear her voice in my head right now. Like it's on a scale of zero to 10, it's almost an eight right now, especially if I close my eyes, right? Well, imagine you're a newlywed. You're in an apartment, in South Salt Lake. You're both going to, you're going to the University of Utah, both of you. One of you is an accounting major. The other is going into nursing. You're in an apartment complex. It's a Friday night, and every Friday night is date night for you because you're poor college students. You get a takeout pizza, and you watch a video on Netflix. You sit on the couch, and it's just kind of a fun evening, right? Uh, and then you hear a knock at the door, and you get knocks at the door all the time because it's a really close apartment complex. It's like 1130. So you get up and you go out to the door, and, as you, and you've got you know, the little chain locks, which we now know are useless. You unlock the deadbolt and you open it and the door slams into your face, knocks you to the ground. Three people come in and they beat your partner with a wooden bat that's cut in half and wrapped in duct tape. So he's senseless. He's on the floor. And then they wrap his feet, hands in duct tape and put one around his mouth and his eyes, just his nose. Then they drag you from room to room. And in the course of just a, a minute, trying to have you grab what little possessions you have, you lose your diamond ring, a little bit of cash, a pocket watch your grandpa gave you. And then they leave, and you're left there. Well, how real is that thought every day after? Like, it's there. And you can be walking down the street, you could be at work, you could be sitting behind your computer, you could be in class, and boom, that thought hits. And because it's so real, it impacts how your body feels. And you automatically go into fight, flight, and freeze. You can't think, you can't focus, the room closes in on you, and all of a sudden you're reliving that experience. And that's every part of your day. And then nightmares. Y'all remember nights, was it Nightmare on Elm Street? Freddy Krueger, the big claws? Imagine going to bed and that's your reality. And knowing that some point during the night you're going to have a nightmare that's so horrific going to cause you to wake up. Or maybe what is even worse, you won't be able to wake up. and You'll have to just wait for your partner to shake you. How many of you all have had nightmares in here? Like when I have a nightmare, especially the one where I'm like in high school again and I'm walking down the hallway and I all of a sudden I realize I'm naked, right? You wake up and for a moment it feels real. Imagine every night that's part of your reality. And so all you want to do is just sleep. At some point, you'll do whatever it takes, medication, alcohol, any type of substance. Maybe I'll just stay up for two or three days in a row just so I can get that one night of peaceful sleep. But these nightmares become really real, and they stick with you throughout the day. And then avoidance behaviors, meaning you start to avoid anything and everything that reminds you of the traumatic event. So let's take this case study, that, uh, this family that I saw about a year ago. What might she start to avoid? Sex, right? Intimacy. Her own apartment complex. Her partner. We can go on and on and on and generate a pretty large list. But we avoid because it reminds you of the traumatic event. And when you get reminded of the traumatic event, you start to respond physically as if it's happened. So imagine being with your partner as a newlywed, someone you love more than anything. You're so excited to start your life with. And every time you see this person, all you see is the duct tape and the blood. You know, and, and you, you try and have an intimate relationship and you just freeze and seize. You can't quite explain it. 
at some point, you know, usually about three weeks, your family says, you got to get over this, you know? I mean, come on, it's been three weeks. It's been three years. It's been a decade. It's been 30 years. But you can't. And you, you go to a really dark and helpless place. And just, I can't. I don't know why this is happening. And you start to think you're going crazy because you're avoiding everything that could possibly be unsafe. And then this emotional numbing this is, we see this a lot in first responders. You go to an accident and like a head will roll by. Oh, that's a head. You don't, you don't even feel anything, right? You're seeing these horrific, unbelievable, traumatic events that's going to devastate and impact a family, possibly a community, and it doesn't even buzz you. You don't even notice. Like it's just another day. You're completely numb. And you don't think that's bizarre. That's just the norm, right? but you're just numb to it. And that's how we avoid. That's how we cope. That's how we manage. It's a big part of why we have post-traumatic stress. And then this hyperarousal. Um, you're always jacked up. I like to use this example. I walk out of Albertsons, and if I see a cop car, I look to see how far the police car is parked away from Albertsons. If it's close right up front, that means there's probably someone inside and there might be an incident. If it's parked, you know, three or four stalls away, I know it's probably just a police officer after work picking up dinner. Amber doesn't even notice there's a police car. <laughs> right? I hear a siren, and I wonder, where's it going to? Who's involved? What type of incident? Um, you know, Amber will be driving down the road, and uh, a police siren will come on behind us, and whoosh, she'll do a quick breath check. Okay, I'm sober. That's right, I haven't been drinking tonight. And the cop car will go by, and she'll be like, whew. And then two seconds later, she's, the wheels on the bus go round and round, because we have a one-year-old, right? And, uh, but not me. I stay hyper-aroused. I stay, my body stays tense. My mind stays ready to act. I'm wondering, is that police officer going to my community? Are there going to be more police officers? Did something happen? Is someone being shot at? Well, do I need to take the back roads to make sure I'm safe? Should I get off the freeway? And that's what starts to spin through my mind. And that can go on and on and on if I don't have some way to turn that off, right? I go to a concert, Red Butte, trombone shorty. Amber's up there when they're doing the conga. She's like third. I'm clear in the back. I'm as far back as you can get so I can see everybody, right? And I've got my taser in our wine bag. <laughs> I'd bring something more helpful if I could, but Amber's, she draws a line of tasers. Um, that's that hyper arousal. It's with you 24 7, right? You just don't turn it off. And then you start to see challenges with your work and home life that people notice, especially your partner. Um, some of the challenges we see is. When you're off, maybe you're drinking too much. You know, just to kind of numb and relax out. Maybe you can't go to a social party, a social situation without a few. You find yourself agitated and irritable, highly critical. Um, you know, little things become really big deals. Uh, and you point those out on a regular basis. And you find yourself just on edge all the time. Because of that, guess what happens to your partner, your family, your friends, your coworkers? They walk on eggshells around you. They don't quite know when you're going to kaboom, explode. And when you do explode on those few occasions where you lose it, you feel so guilty afterwards, so embarrassed, so ashamed. But what do you start to do? You go back to this avoidance thing. So why is all of this happening? And here's how you know if you really have people this is your life when you go home at night. This is your life at work. This is your relationships. If you've got one, three, maybe five, maybe all of these happening, it's time to self-reflect and say, whoa, I'm having a normal reaction to the job. I'm having a normal reaction to responding on a day-to-day -day basis to significant trauma and crisis. I'm having a normal reaction to trauma. This, this is what it looks like. Can't relax. 
using a little bit too much of whatever your choice is, not sleeping well, that numb and detachment, that relationship issues, those intrusive thoughts we talked about, just feeling worn out, but not like the kind of worn out that I felt when I hiked out of Bright Angel. It was 9.5 miles. It was awesome. I was really worried I wouldn't make it because I'm way out of shape and had a baby. But I got to the top and I was like floored exhausted. I'm still a little tired from it. But it felt good, right? Now I'm talking the exhausted that doesn't feel good. You can't shake. That feels heavy. It feels just like handcuffs or tar. You're just, you just feel so worn out. Like at, at, at a soul type level. And then every part of your life just, and it seems not to be quite as crisp or as clear. So here's why. First is the quantity. The intensity, like how often are you exposed to trauma? Can one event cause post-traumatic stress? Absolutely. Does it make sense that if we start to add trauma upon that, you become more at risk. Just like smoking, right? You have one cigarette, it's going to cause some, some issues. If you smoke for five years, you're probably going to get lung cancer. The same with trauma. The more you're exposed to it, the more at risk you are for the signs and symptoms of PTSD. Where you process PTSD in your brain, now this is a big one. Do we have anybody here that knows Greek mythology? You probably all know Zeus, right? You all know Poseidon? Zeus's brother. You know, Zeus and Poseidon really don't like each other. Mostly because Poseidon is a nag, right? He's constantly on Zeus's case to get stuff done wherever they exist. So one time, you know, Zeus just is like, I'm done. You have bugged me enough. And so he casts Poseidon into the ocean, right? And now I can avoid you. I can ignore you. Well, guess what Poseidon does? He gets pissed. And so he wreaks havoc on the oceans. A human can't walk on water or right, take a boat or go anywhere near the ocean without dying. And so all the humans start praying to Zeus, hey, can you tell your brother Poseidon to knock it off? This really sucks. It gets so bad that Zeus is like, fine. What do you want, Poseidon? Poseidon was, well, just come on have a talk and get coffee sometime. So Zeus says, fine. Let's have a regular weekly meeting where we can kind of figure out what's going on. Well, this is how PTSD works in your brain. Your primitive brain is where that memory first hits, right? That fight, flight, or freeze. Well, if your primitive brain can't talk to your executive brain because your executive brain wants to avoid it, doesn't want to be reminded of it, doesn't want to relive it or experience it, then you're going to have nightmares and intrusive thoughts and hyperarousal. That, that's Poseidon saying, hey, we need to have a conversation. My primitive brain needs to talk to my executive brain so I can learn and grow from this. I need to see this through a bigger lens. I can't just see it through my fight, flight, and freeze, that part of me, the aggressive defensive piece. I need to get up into my prefrontal cortex, my limbic system, and my neocortex, where I can have emotion uh, that I can add to this, like love and caring and compassion and humility, where I can have logic, like, uh, where I can actually process this in the scope of everything I am where I can really then start to make decisions actively about what is a threat and what is not. But as long as the brains are not communicating, primitive to executive, you're going to see serious problems with post-traumatic stress. That's kind of what we've now learned as effective treatments, of, not even treatment, effective tools, are tools that help you move those memories into a place where you can process it, where you can make sense of it, where you can learn and grow. So here's the deal. Let me straight up with you. If humans did not have the natural ability to deal with trauma, we'd be screwed. We'd be totally screwed because life is trauma, right? So what's cool about PTSD is it's 100% manageable. It actually can make you stronger. I'm really excited that I have post-traumatic stress. I am a much different person because of it. More humble more compassionate, more loving. I appreciate every moment in life more because my executive brain has learned and I've grown from those trauma experiences. 
by putting them in a place where I can make sense of them. That's how we really manage post-traumatic stress. Now, what keeps you from really healing from trauma? Shame, guilt, anger, fear, and expectations of others. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if you're a first responder and you have post-traumatic stress and it's impacting your life, how willing are you to share that with your administration? You're struggling? Hell no. Like, I didn't want to go to the chief of psychiatry and say, hey, I have post-traumatic stress and I'm on the inpatient psych ward. <laughs> I thought they'd fire me. I didn't want my friends and family to know that every night I was terrified and that I struggled. And I didn't want them to even get into my mind some of the paranoid thoughts I had on a regular basis. I didn't want them to know that, yeah, on occasion, I thought about that endless sleep. How nice would it be just to go to sleep and never wake up again? Now, luckily, I had a lot of things in my life that kept me alive. But boy, I thought about it once or twice. I'm not going to share that, right? That would make me weak make me unprofessional. I don't struggle. I'm rich. I'm what, and everyone turns to me. It's that shame. It's that guilt that keeps us from raising our hand and saying, hey, I need some tools. I need to learn how to manage this so I can put it in my executive brain and get back to living life. We struggle because we don't have the tools. All of you who are first responders have tools to do your job, right? But any one of you We'll use our, remind me your name, Lisa. Would you go into the field without your gun? Why? Because people want to kill you. Would you go without your vest? Would you walk in to do your job just like I'm dressed, just civilian clothes? Well, then why do we walk into these environments without the tools to shield our mind? It's craziness basic tools to help us move trauma into the executive brain so we can become resilient. Tools that are already part of it. But we're not using them. We're not teaching them. We're not spending the time we need to have mastery. I mean, how much time on the range do you spend on a regular basis to be proficient with your weapon? I'm guessing significant time. You know, the KSAs that you weekly focus on, ain't what, how many are required a year by firefighters, 40? I have 40 CEUs I'm required to attend. Are, are we doing that with the mind? No, not even close. Leadership expectations. You know, I was disgusted by someone in leadership this week that said combat vets should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get over it, right? We have leaders who don't understand trauma. Our administration doesn't understand trauma. They don't understand its impact, that it's a normal response to a traumatic event, and that we, in leadership, need to provide opportunities and tools for you to manage your stress, your trauma, part of a job. Leadership needs to be assigning these tools just like they would a firearm or your protective gear or rubber gloves. And that needs to be just the norm, not the exception. And then finally, your families are not trauma-informed. Your agencies aren't trauma-informed. Let me tell you how helpful it is when I work with a couple. I work with a lot with firefighters and police officers and combat, active duty combat veterans. I sit down and I do the same presentation for the partner. I say, here's a few skill sets that you can help your partner out with. And they become a team instead of opposing each other. Instead of distant and avoidant, they become connected. And the family becomes part of the process. Amber's trauma-informed. When I start to get worked up, she can see it. Instead of being critical of me, which activates it even more, she'll come give me a hug and say, you got some storylines going on, don't you? I can see this as a little bit of a flare-up. I'm like, yeah, you're right. And she'll say, what triggered you? you got some patterns. Uh, which one of your patterns is present? She says, oh, you know, I think it's this. And then we, we talk it through, and I'm good. But how many of your partners, your family members, those you work with, are trauma-informed, experts in PTSD? They get it. They understand it. They can see the signs and the symptoms. They know when you're starting to flare up. And they have basic tools to support you. How many? A couple? That's where we really get traction, is when the community supports the person who has a part of the job 
is experiencing trauma and stress in their brain. And we not only provide the tools to you, but we provide the tools to the entire community. So we are trauma-informed society. So what works? Well, this is where I'm going to get on my box, my stool. Prevention. Let me tell you, by the time someone comes to me after years of having post-traumatic stress, their brain has changed. Their hypothalamus has shrunk. They're having problems with producing serotonin, right? Their marriage has ended. Maybe their second and third marriage, too. They're on the edge of losing their job, and usually they have some type of an addiction. Their finances are, are in shambles, and their body's a mess. That's a lot to work with. That's not like something that in oh, three sessions we can work with. It takes months. It doesn't take months to manage the post-traumatic stress. It takes months to manage the issues that have occurred because of the post-traumatic stress. But prevention, providing day one basic tools to shield your mind, well, it prevents all that, right? If every first responder had basic training on what trauma is, the signs and symptoms, what to look for, and a handful of tools we know are very effective and easy to use to manage it, Imagine what we'd achieve, accomplish. As far as just quality of life, savings in medical and leave time, <laughs> savings in divorce rates. Basic prevention is the number one thing we should be looking at. Now, when post-traumatic stress is present, our agencies need to be trauma-informed. Your mayor, your battalion chiefs, your administrators, all of our leadership needs to have the same presentation where they understand trauma and they provide avenues for all of us to get the training and support we need to manage the trauma, to work through it, figure it out, to process it in our executive brain so we can write right back on the job. It's, as I was coming here, they were doing a, you know, Top 700 was doing you know, the sports channel I kind of like, especially during college football. And they were interviewing Nate Orchard with the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Browns, and he injured his leg, a high ankle sprain, and so he's out for a couple weeks. What do you think the Cleveland Browns are doing to support him while he's injured? Oh, it's amazing. Like, he was talking about the cool stuff he's getting to do, cryo freezes, nitrogen packs, he's got a personal trainer. So when someone gets injured physically on the job, everyone steps up, right? Like how many casseroles come to your door? <laughs> what happens when it's an injury of the mind? Ah, everybody gets scared. Everybody gets silent. There aren't really ways we go about handling that. You know, you, some people say, well, just deal with it. You know, I'm fine. You should be too. Some people say, well, maybe we shouldn't have you on the job. Our leadership should be upfront and forefront in providing opportunities for first responders who are at high risk for PTSD to get the tools they need to manage their stress. Trauma informed families. Basically, I'd like our world to be trauma-informed. Yeah, the I, I would teach this in elementary school. You want to know why we have bullies? Because they're not trauma-informed. They're avoiding or escaping or using power and control because they're scared. Really, we need to have trauma-informed communities because life is traumatic. We need to have basic skills for how do you deal with tough situations. What I do as a professional when I work with clients is what we call mapping, mind-body maps, where we look at negative self-beliefs due to the traumatic event, where we look at what triggers you, events that cause your body to become hyper-aroused and your thoughts to become paranoid. We look at the trauma itself. What about the trauma has altered your perception of you and others in the world? And we look at those secondary wounding events, things that happen post-trauma that are hurtful. Um, when someone says, get over it, or that's not that big of a deal, or why are you upset? And then we look at the nightmares, specifically what's creating that. And then I create communication through this mapping process with the executive brain. So you can learn and problem solve and, and, and see it through a few basic tool sets. It's, it's not complicated. It's not this huge, big, long process. It's basic tool sets we use to help a person on a regular basis master the ability to move into the executive brain to see the trauma. And then finally, 
And this is a big source of contention. Medication. A lot of people don't want to take medication for post-traumatic stress. I'm going to go on a limb. I've never shared this. I take a pill every single day for my PTSD. Because you know what? I had post-traumatic stress for so many years. It altered my brain, and I don't produce the same amount of serotonin that most people do. And so I take a pill for my arthritis. really helps because I get flare-ups if I don't. And I take a pill so I can keep a little more serotonin in my brain. It really helps me executively function and having that moment to take a step and say, okay, you're having body tension. You've been triggered by something. Well, what is it that triggered you? Well, let's figure out, is this real or is it not real? Let's put this into your executive brain where you know how to problem solve. And then usually I'm fine. It helps me sleep a little bit better because I don't get the panic attacks I used to. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be brave here. I, I am happy saying I have post-traumatic stress and I take a pill for it. Okay? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with people knowing. I think that makes me stronger. I think that makes all of us stronger when we can say, hey, I have post-traumatic stress, and that's really cool. <laughs> because I am a different person because of it. I wouldn't want to take back what's happened to me because I see the world through such unique eyes now, eyes that I really like. But it's the process of embracing PTSD, understanding it, and then learning how to manage it that makes us, those of us who have post-traumatic stress, exceptional people. So that's the presentation. I'm going to leave it wide open for questions, thoughts, feedback. Yes. So what is it, what happened? One sec. I'm going to give you the micro, microphone here. What happens in the brain that when you were talking in the beginning about how just out of nowhere an event, the event that caused, or events that caused PTSD are just there full force. It's just like they knock people over because it's just like, where'd that come from? There wasn't necessarily a trigger. How, what's, what creates that? So the brain and body are trying very hard to make sense of this trauma. They're trying to assimilate that into your schema of life, right? How, how do I make sense of this? Uh, all of my life events, everything I believe, all of my values, now I have this pretty significant event. I need to make sense of it. But guess what I want to do more than anything? Forget it. I want to shove that so far down that I don't ever think about it. But it needs to be processed. It needs to come up, and so it does on a regular basis. And then guess what I do? I respond as if the trauma is happening in that moment. It's like it's real. It's like that memory I had you. That, you know, it's an eight. Well, it becomes a 10 for the person. And the fight, flight, and freeze system kicks in. And in that moment, the body doesn't know that the memory isn't real. And it responds. Cortisol floods the brain, shutting down the prefrontal cortex. You get adrenaline, noradrenaline. Your muscles start to condense as blood moves from the inner body to, to get to react. And it just, it puts you in a bad space. That's kind of what's happening. Did that answer your question okay? Other thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Can you uh, address your prevention tools? Your prevention tools? So my prevention tools. Well, you got to see them all today. Here's my prevention tools. First, understanding what post-traumatic stress is. That it's a normal response to your job, right? Normalizing. The next is understanding what trauma does to us. It creates negative self-thoughts. It creates a need to fix those. And it creates what I call storylines. Stories that spin and spin and spin. In addition, it creates body tension and mind clutter. You become hyper aroused. How do you rest that? By tuning into your senses, by being aware of your storylines, and understanding your triggers, journaling them, tracking them, seeing patterns and then processing those in your executive brain through what we call a mapping system. We look at how you see it when you're in full flight, flight, and freeze, and we have you through sensory activities re-examine that same situation when you're calm and relaxed through your executive brain. It's very easy to do, quick to handle, and that's what we teach. So before the trauma even happens, I know what to do. I know how to respond. It's the same principle as all the training U.S. first responders went through to handle a crisis. 
mean, do you know how much training I had to go through to manage a psychotic break on inpatient psych? It's not like they just shoved me in there and said, good luck. And the HIPAA training I had to go to protect privacy, two years of clinical training at the U plus 4,000 hours post-graduation to be able to work with clients who have mental health issues, plus a postgraduate certification. I mean, we have training. And so prevention is about basic training I would need as a first responder to manage what happens to the mind when there's a crisis. And it takes about an hour and a half like 90 minutes. When I train our cadets for Salt Lake City Fire Department, it takes me 90 minutes to give them the tools they need to shield their mind. Great question. Other thoughts, questions for me? Feedback, yes. Do you think, do you think that there's an addictive quality to um, first responders reliving those memories and having that adrenaline dump where like, they know, like, I've done it myself, or I know I'm going down a storyline but I'm so angry and mad, it gives me a, a release. The addictive quality behind that is the anger, the release, helps you avoid dealing with the traumatic event. Can you, can you repeat his question? Yeah, his question was, is there addictive quality when that memory comes up in my mind, spinning it out of control, being angry and upset about it? Absolutely. There's an addictive quality to cutting, right? Those are, are of us who are clinicians, you know, why do people cut? Well, it, you can avoid the emotional pain you're having inside by dealing with the physical pain on the outside, right? You get pissed off, oh yeah, it's a great avoidance technique. Fun, man, it's like on top of the world because you don't have to deal with the emotional stuff going on inside. That's far more complicated. And so, what's reinforced? What works? If I'm having issues with post-traumatic stress, why not just get pissed off about it? It works, right, for a moment. So I'm in a constant state of just being pissed off because that's how I deal with it. How many first responders are pissed off all the time? <laughs> well, yeah. Other thoughts, questions for me? OK, going on with that one. Let me give you the microphone. Oh. Um, so would that, would that tie into also people that have PTSD and they tend to keep on going towards careers that are where there's going to be crisis, a lot oh, of crisis, yeah. or when you talk about people that have been in combat and they keep on going back tour after tour after tour. Is that just a way? We'll explain that a little bit more. Well, one, there are some of us who are, are just attracted to high-risk adventures, right? <laughs> Um, so when I was on the Grand Canyon for 10 days, I didn't have a single nightmare, a single intrusive thought. I didn't even think about my world here because I was so focused on surviving. Uh, I was so engaged in, you know, basically an expedition where it's a private trip, so you carry everything with you, setting up the kitchen every day, the groover, unpacking the food and your gear, and then just getting through the rapids is like the thought before it, I mean, it's absolutely, it's, it becomes avoidant. Um, but it decreases the quality of the experience. So when I had post-traumatic stress, flare-ups, I'd take Amber backcountry skiing, right? I'd be booking up the hill fast as I could because I wanted that rush. I'd be turning back, Amber, come on, you're being slow on purpose. <laughs> She'd be just like, and then, you know, about halfway up, I'm like, okay, beacon check. And she's like, oh, I forgot my beacon. <laughs> and I would wig out. I'm like, you could die without your beacon. So then instead of being safe or just touring low, I'd make us drive all the way back home, get her beacon, come all the way back up, not talking to her the whole time, right? Because I wanted to know how serious this is. Finally, we get to the top of the mountain, and it's, we call it Meltdown Mountain because it was a meltdown. <laughs> Now that I manage my PTSD, we do low angle stuff and we ski together, and it's about the relationship, not the rush. And so when my fight flight is active, how I engage recreation is much different than when my executive brain is functioning. Instead of going for that big hit, I'm probably gonna run a conservative line. It's different. 
because I'm not seeking to avoid, I'm seeking to engage. And PTSD is really an issue of avoidance. That's how you try and manage it. Avoid anything you possibly can that reminds you of the trauma or you do anything you possibly can to avoid thinking about it. Anything else I can answer for you? Questions, thoughts, feedback? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, hypnosis. Hypnosis. Do you practice it? Do you believe in it? No. <laughs> no. Um, no. Uh, I, I don't want to discount any type of therapeutic or treatment. I'm not trained in hypnosis. I don't understand it. Um, I've been very invested in cognitive behavioral and mindful techniques that keep the person present in order for them to learn and grow from the trauma. So I, I couldn't give you a professional opinion on whether hypnosis works or doesn't. So I, I just don't use it. Okay, thanks everybody. We got a we couple got a questions. So EMDR. Oh, EMDR, brilliant. EMDR is wonderful. It's an amazing technique. Why? What's the purpose of eye movement desensitization reprocessing? to take those memories that are stuck in that primitive brain and help you process them in the executive through using sensory activities. It engages the body's natural, normal process for healing from trauma. It's a brilliant technique and very similar to what mind-body bridging and other mindfulness-based mindfulness -based techniques do to really help you become resilient to and learn from trauma. So yeah, EMDR is very effective. So a lot of friends and family that have been in the military served, um, one of the things that I've kind of noticed is that it seems that um, they're treating a lot of it in situations with medication instead of behavioral type things like you described today here. I, what's your thoughts on, do you feel that it is over medicated right now and it should be treated differently? What's your thoughts on that sure. kind of? Every person should be treated as an individual first where a comprehensive assessment is done of the family, the person, the environment, how the trauma is impacting them, uh, how long they've had the trauma, the quantity of the trauma, how serious the symptoms are. Based on that, a comprehensive plan should be created with the, all the stakeholders involved in that person's life. Medication alone is not effective. It does help. The medication in combination with behavioral therapies, with mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapies, and the training for the families, very, very effective. So I'd say I can't generalize it because each person's PTSD is unique to them and needs to be seen as such. Yes, Carrie. Is there any literature or books that you recommend? <laughs> uh, Mind-body bridging treatment of trauma. I can post these if you'd like. Aphrodite Metastas, I can't get over it. Her book on trauma, wonderful. Lisa Najovic, Seeking Safety, is fantastic. Um, I, I can create a whole list of books for you that are really helpful. One of the best interventions for families is John Gottman's work on marriage. Very effective in helping couples understand how to connect and communicate. Instead of being critical and defensive and being contemptuous and then stonewalling or avoidant, it teaches how to do soft startups, how to be aware of what's triggering for the person, how to then be open for influence and learn and grow from your partner, how to then really focus on the positives, who that person is in their heart and their soul versus what you're seeing maybe when they're frustrated, and then how to do repair attempts and engage. So, yeah, I find Gottman really effective for that couples piece. But if you'd like, I'll give Carrie a whole list of books and articles that I find very helpful for working with trauma. Seven principles for a effective marriage or a happy marriage. I forget which. Anything else I can answer for you? Okay, thanks everybody for having me. Thanks.